what thing you can do that will make the biggest difference in your life and in the world? What thing you can do that, you, that will make the biggest difference in your life and in the world? I'll give you a few seconds to think about it. I don't know, I don't think it's uh, something that you can come up with right away, but if you haven't, then keep thinking about it during the day. And if you already know what it is, then hopefully you'll do it. But I'd like to propose to you what that one thing is. Sometimes you might be thinking, well, if I pray more, well, obviously prayer is important, it's good or I'm going to go and join the Peace Corps or I'll give, you know, be a missionary somewhere in third world countries. That's great. That's wonderful. But whatever it is that we do, we have to remember we don't do it by ourselves. We do it part of a community. There's got to be other missionaries with you. You're going to pray by yourself, okay, but where that prayer will lead you, usually God leads us to go out to reach out to others, not just to be contemplatives or living by ourselves in our bubble, just me and God. It always will put us with people. And when we're other people, one thing will always happen. Conflict. Someone will step on your toes, you step on somebody's toes, somebody will say or do something that will hurt you or you'll hurt them, and there'll be conflict. And then, what happens? A lot of times, I think, left to us, we try to kind of ignore it, move away, ignore that person. But I think the one thing that we, if we all do, that will make the biggest difference is in healing broken relationships. Because if we're doing all that good, and in the same time, we're breaking all these relationships, we get angry, we're hurt, somebody's angry at us. That's going to lead to more division, to more separation. It doesn't lead us to become, get together. It doesn't lead to unity. And look at our world. Look at the church. We have divisions everywhere. Look at our nation, our families, our parish. There's divisions everywhere. And that's because we refuse most of the time to heal those relationships. Either we leave them alone or we approach it from the sense, I'm right and you're wrong and let me tell you what you did wrong. The first reading addresses our option not to do anything about it, to keep just quiet. And you know from practical purposes, if it's the same person you interact with on a regular basis, sooner or later one of you going to explode and it's a big issue. But the re what we usually choose is to remain quiet. And the first reading tells us you cannot remain quiet. The same thing the gospel tells us, you cannot ignore these things. But the problem is we approach it from more a judgmental approach. Approach who's right and wrong. Well, the second letter reminds us we need to put it in the context of love, love for the person who has offended us, love for the person who's doing the wrong things. The first reading tells us you can't keep quiet because if someone is doing something that's wrong and you keep quiet, you're responsible for their actions because you haven't led them and open their eyes to see the light and to do what is the right thing. We can't just keep quiet. We are responsible. But again, it's not about condemning and judging them, but approaching them in love, concerned about them, because they might be doing something that doesn't concern you. It's the way they're living our life, because our faith is a way of life. It's not just believing in our heads. And when we see something specially committed by someone we care about, we're called to speak up, 
to speak up in love, in charity, because we're concerned about their salvation. What's at hand is their salvation. It's not about you. That's how we approach it with love. And we do this in other areas of our lives. You know, in dealing, maybe you have a, a member of the family who's an alcoholic or drug addicted. You don't just keep quiet. Sooner or later, the family will come together and they'll do what we call an intervention and help the person realize what they're doing is hurting him or her, that they need to get help. And you do it for their own good. But when it comes to our faith and how we live our faith, sometimes we didn't think that's as important. Oh, I'll just keep quiet, you know. Let them live their life. Let them do whatever they want. Because we don't want anyone telling us how we should our lives or bringing to our attention where we're failing. So the easy way out, live and let live. But that's not really the loving thing to do. If you truly believe that that person, eternal life, is in danger. We need to speak out in love. We need to speak out so that person realizes it's, we're concerned about them and not what they're doing to us. Jesus tells us another approach. And in all the Gospels, the only time Jesus gives us like a specific step-by-step -step approach to deal with conflict is when he's talking about conflict. He says, if your brother sins against you, what's the next step? Come on, you heard it. What should happen next? You go talk to him. Remember, he sinned or she sinned against you, and you're supposed to go talk to him. Well, yes, when hell freezes over. <laughs> Why should I go to them? They offended me. I'm going to sit and wait for them to come and apologize. And then maybe I'll forgive them. But I'm hurt. But again, if you put it in the context of love, you're hurt. But they're doing things that's going to damage their eternal life. They're going down the wrong path. Maybe they lied to you. Maybe they cheated you. Whatever it is, you need to bring to their attention their actions, because you're concerned about them, not just you. So you go to them. You mend that relationship, because if you don't, it's going to hurt you more than your pride when you go and talk to them. It's going to eat at you from the inside. And especially, let's say, a lot of times it's with people who are close to us, whether family members or coworkers, best friends, siblings, we hold on to that anger and that hurt and pain because we're not willing to go to them and talk to them about their actions. And then Jesus said, if that doesn't work, then take one or two other people, people that they trust, that maybe they may be open to listening to them since they're not involved in that situation. Let them talk to them. Let them kind of be the middle person trying to bring peace and healing to that relationship. And if that doesn't work, go to the church. Well, obviously, today you can't like bring 1,000 people with you and go talk to that person. But the church today is there in the Word of God. Talk to them about what our faith tells us about it. What did Jesus say about it? What does it say in the Scriptures about it? Because, again, the purpose is to rescue them. Not your hurt feelings. But when you heal that relationship, you're healed yourself too. And if that doesn't work, Jesus tells us, treat him as a tax collector or a Gentile. Now, whose gospel is it that we read from today? It was a gospel of Matthew. And what did Matthew do before he became disciple? Tax collector. When we hear this, we're thinking, well, that's where excommunication comes in. If they're not going to listen, then the church says, well, we have nothing to do. We're going to wash our hands from you. May God have mercy on you. That's not what Jesus means, because that's not how he treated tax collectors. 
When he saw Matthew, he didn't say, oh, well, that's a tax collector. Let me get away from him. He went to Matthew and said, come and follow me. And Matthew threw a great banquet for him. And many more tax collectors came and sinners. What Jesus is telling us is we need to kind of start again from ground level in our relationship with this person. That they don't trust us somehow. That they're not sure of our love for them. And we need to rebuild that relationship from scratch. Why? Because we're concerned about them. In other words, to sum this process is basically saying to heal a a broken relationship, you got to throw love on it and keep putting more and more love, investing in it yourself because you're the disciple. It's not about right and wrong. It's not about we should take the first step. It's as disciple of Jesus Christ, we're called to love, even in those situations that are difficult for us to deal with because we're right. But there is the soul of one person or many people online, and that's what we should be focused on, saving souls for Jesus Christ. It's not about our pride, because our pride will hurt us too. We need to let go and pour out love on those involved in that situation. That's how we mend relationships. Isn't that what Jesus did? Jesus did not die on the cross so there will be no more poverty or hunger or disease. He died on the cross to heal our broken relationship with God the Father. That's the difference he made in the world. And he's calling us to do the same thing, to follow his example, his way of that unconditional love that he poured out till his last breath for the hope of healing our relationship with God. All of us, I think, we know someone where our relationship with them needs some healing. So I want you to think of that person. Come up with a name. And maybe the first step of you going to that person, maybe you're not ready to go physically but you go, can go spiritually by saying a prayer, a prayer for that person. That when you go to them, they will not harden their hearts, but they will receive your love with gratitude and reciprocate that love back to you. Start praying for them. There is what, about two, three billion Christians in the world? Just imagine if each one of us worked on healing a broken relationship. I bet you that will make a difference in this world.